My name is John Dacey, and I've spent the last 33 years serving youth and families in public education, mostly in urban centers in the United States, and some of the most difficult school systems. I've been a teacher and a principal in New York, and a superintendent in Rhode Island, twice in California, Prince George's County in the DC area, and most recently in Los Angeles. And we saw pretty amazing results in achievement and graduation rates, and dramatic drops in suspension rates for the 909,000 youth of LA. But every Sunday, I would spend time in my local prisons and jails visiting students who had not been successful or who we had not been successful with. And when I retired from public education two years ago, I made a public promise that I would spend the next 15 years of my life trying to help solve one of the most vexing and insidious problems in the United States, and that is our mass incarceration of our citizens and our young people. There are good and promising practices in diversionary and prevention work and reentry work but there's been little successful program and progress being made in the actual work of incarceration. So I want to welcome you to this collective impact challenge. In the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to share some national and local perspective in the United States and one promising pioneering practice. This is not going to be an uplifting talk. This is not going to be a talk that's going to offer personal tips for relaxation or solutions for personal stress, status, happiness, connectiveness, online opportunities, or wealth creation. But it is going to be very honest, and it's going to be very direct, and it's going to be a bit emotional. And I'm going to try to offer one solution set, which I want to engage an entire community in trying to alter the astonishing status of the United States of Corrections. This talk isn't going to have video or moving films or a beautiful PowerPoint and no humorous quips. The lights are a little bit low, and this is actually quite deliberate, and if I had my way, your cell phones would be taken away from you, and so would your devices, and the doors would be locked, and some of you would be in small cages, because that is the reality for millions and millions of people in this country this morning um, in the United States of corrections. I want this feeling so that you are a bit overwhelmed with negative information coming at you, and you can just have a moment or two where it's difficult to catch your breath so that you can have that feeling. You know, in the United States, we don't have the tallest building in the world any longer, and we do not have the largest Ferris wheel in the world any longer, and we don't have the largest indoor shopping mall. But this country, which boasts the center of democracy for the planet and the only country to have an intact constitution throughout its entire inception, including living through a civil war, is number one in at least one point in the world. It's the percentage of the population we put in prison. We have 5% of the world's population and more than 25% of the world's prisoners. We incarcerate per capita more human beings than any other country on the planet. And the treatment and the type of punishment that's been handed down in many cases is nothing short of what we have exercised economic sanctions against other countries for the same. Now, since about 2002, one in every 142 Americans has actually been imprisoned. One out of every 32 of us has been in prison and or been on parole. More than 3% of the entire population are now or have been part of the non-voluntary member of America's correctional community. And there are vastly more Americans, total, who have been in jail, imprisoned, paroled, or probation than the sum total of the government's estimate of illegal immigrants in this country, something we seem to be wringing our hands about all the time. Four out of five people who are on parole are men, and nearly half of them are black men. Let's take a moment and discuss black men for a second. In New York City, there's 120,000 black men between 25 and 54 years of old who are missing from everyday life. In Chicago, it's 45,000. In Philadelphia, it's 30,000. Access and across this nation, we know that there are more than 1.5 million missing black men. They are behind bars or dead. So let me make this data point perfectly clear. Out of every six black men today alive between the age of 25 and 54, one has disappeared from daily life. And of the black men who are alive today between 25 and 54, the so-called prime ages, one out of 12 are behind bars, 
and that's compared to one out of 60 non-black men, one out of 200 for black women, one out of 500 for non-black women. The human tragedy of this and its effect on the orphaned children, widowed women, either widowed by death or imprisonment, is mind-boggling. But so too is the economic impact. We have a mass number of non-wage earning, non-tax paying, non-community contributing individuals in this country. And recidivism in this country points that it's simply not working. On average across this country, if you are 21 or younger, your rate of recidivism is about 70% that you will reoffend within three years of being released, and a little bit more than 50% if you're older than that. And that ranges hugely by state. I live and work in the state of California, the state that I call home at this point in my life. And if we were a country, we'd be the eighth largest economy in the world. It is the so-called golden state. It's vastly liberal bastion of political and personal freedoms are found everywhere. My state has dog spas. We find people in excess of speeding on an interstate for littering and jaywalking, smoking in public. We prohibit the use of plastic bags for groceries everywhere. We've legalized marijuana, and we severely penalize those who pollute the atmosphere. Folks will say there's a very strong sense of conscience and social conscience in the state. My state also has pet mortuaries, where the cost of interning and burying a chihuahua can be more than it cost to bury my old man. And today, this golden state has the highest number of individuals serving a life or virtual life sentence in the entire United States. As Joan Didion once said many years ago, in her searing essay published in Slouching Towards Bethlehem, California has an addiction to locking people up. Way back then, she noted what looked like the beginning of a prison industrial complex. One out of seven state and federal prisons in the United States is serving a life or virtual life sentence. In California, it's 31% of all prisoners, more than 130,000 individuals this morning. More disturbing, California is the state with the highest number of juveniles serving a life or virtual life sentence in the whole country. If you give my language, I want to be really clear. They're children. They are not juveniles. More than 3,000 children are currently serving a life sentence in California. Between 1984 and 2005, 21 new state-of-the-art prisons were built in California and immediately filled to overcapacity. We went from a state budget of one billion dollars to, in 2015, 9.5 billion annual dollars to run corrections. And I think I struggled to raise two million annually to change this. This dramatic rise in prison population and corrections and jailing is not an accident. Some sociological phenomena did not befall the United States in the last 20 years. It's been a deliberate and willful act facilitated by laws. We are a nation that lives under the rule of law. Most particular are the laws called the three strike laws, the war on drug laws, the get tough on crime laws, and as Michelle Alexander so aptly and painfully points out, we have now created the new Jim Crow in this country. California has its own special set of laws that adds maximum and mandatory additional time to your sentence, usually 25 years to life, to otherwise understandable sentences, which are given at a judge's discretion after a trial, which are no longer at a judge's discretion at all. The 1020 life law is a perfect example. Anyone 14 years old or older in California who commits a crime and is in possession or uses a firearm it's an automatic three to life added to their sentence without parole. If you use a gun, you're done, was the famous phrase when these laws were brought in. California in 2011 began to reluctantly reduce its prison population due to Supreme Court decision. It ruled that California must reduce by more than 30,000 the number in its prison population because the conditions had violated the Eighth Amendment. Of note, Scalia, in his usually acerbic style of dissent, wrote that this judgment is perhaps the most radical injunction issued by a court in history. In history. Particularly egregious has been the three strikes law 
which basically states that if you commit a third felony and that felony is either serious or violent, you get 25 to life mandatorily added on top of all other previous sentences. I've often wondered how serious the first two felonies were. But we do have information on that. Famous case of Ewing in California, which went to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court basically said the three strikes law does not violate the Eighth Amendment to an individual. In this case, Mr. Ewing's felony, his third felony, was that he had stolen golf clubs from the Los Angeles Country Club. It was deemed a serious offense. In November this year, Prop 57 finally passed in California. Now it takes California off the list of 14 other states that leaves the entire sole discretion to try a child as an adult to the prosecution only. We may be releasing more individuals, but we're refilling our jails and prisons daily. In 2006, the prisons in California were at 200% capacity. Today, we're proud and they're celebrating that we're only at 135% of capacity. Let me say a word about solitary confinement. It's the practice of isolating a person in a closed cell for 24 to 20, 22 to 24 hours a day, virtually free from any human contact, where they're allowed one hour outside in a walled and fenced area commonly called a dog run. It's a term, however, that's almost never used in the correctional facilities of the country. California uses the term security housing units, or SHUs. Their IMUs in Oregon are intensive management units. Their RMUs in Pennsylvania, which are the restricted housing units. And in federal prisons, they are the CMUs, which are the communication management units. We have built special prisons across the country just to expand solitary confinement called Supermax. Pelican Bay is an example in California. We have 44 states with multiple supermax. The current estimate is that there's 100,000 people this morning in solitary, about 4.4% of the entire population. In California, there's more than 7,000 people in solitary as I give this speech, which, by the way, is generally a six, point, a six by nine foot room, no windows, one light, double door, and a slot. Meals come through the slot, and you're allowed to exercise for one hour. California, Texas, and New York have the highest percent of its population solitary in the country. There is a litany of research about the mental illness associated with this. Children are placed in solitary routinely in, in America. And children are imprisoned alongside adult, in adult facilities routinely in America. If you're a child, you're 36 times more likely to kill yourself if you've been housed in an adult facility and you're 19 times more likely to kill yourself if you have been in solitary. Half of all juvenile suicides take place in solitary. Two extraordinary examples come from Florida. The gentleman, young man by the name of E. Emanuel was 15 years old in solitary, tried to kill himself five times when he was convicted as a crime at 17 years old. And in Montana, Risha Katka, the young man, when he committed his crime, at 17, was in solitary, and twice tried to kill himself in solitary by trying to bite his wrists so he could puncture his veins. Many juveniles, however, are routinely put in solitary in jails awaiting adjudication. All you need to do is read about the famous Rikers Island, and you get a sense of the atrocities that are taking place today. <laughs> Actually, you can pick up this morning's New York Times, read the front page, bottom half. California was found to be in violation of its law by placing juveniles multiple, multiple, multiple times in solitary for 24 hours because it violated California's liberal law only allowing 21 hours a day of solitary. And of course, study after study indicates that if you're in solitary, you have statistically a much, much higher percent of chance of recidivism. We have made progress, though. Very recently, the United States has banned solitary confinement for juveniles in federal prisons. I apologize about the data points. I don't have the number of juveniles convicted for insider trading. But it is bleak, and it is troubling, but it need not need so. It need not need 
to be this way. I have begun to talk about the permanent and corrosive effects of having a felony conviction. Even after you've atoned for your crime and served your sentence, millions, in the case of my work, of men cannot vote in this country, own a home, get a job, rent an apartment, earn an income, be a father in proximity to their child because they have had a felony conviction for which they have completely served. They are effectively removed from society permanently. This is what I and others are attempting to alter. My organization is called Reset New Day New Year. And in preparing to do this, I spent a year visiting more than 100 young men who were in jail as juveniles, in jail as young adults, released and out of jail, uh, but were convicted as juveniles and young adults and visited many, many prisons in this country. And I can honestly tell you the only way that I could describe the experience of visiting the prisons was that they were slave ships in dry dock. In this new organization, what we're trying to do is change these data points permanently in this country. We work with 18 to 24-year-old young men who are serving an alternative felony sentence. We're a complete residential treatment facility, an alternative prison, if you might, that promises to graduate 100% of our young men. We use no industrial language like release. 100% of our men will graduate drug and substance free, employed, resilient, and completely and fully graduated from high school with two years of additional post-secondary college completion. It's a two-year residential program and then a third one-year transitional uh, program back to community where the young men re-enter community as productive, contributing, and engaged citizens. We're current, we opened this year and we're currently serving nine young men who started with us. We have almost immediately been approved for 20 additional. In order to gain access to our program, a judge, a DA, court advocate, lawyer, and us must all agree separately that the young man is eligible. There are 51 waiting the opportunity of approved in Alameda County alone. We plan to open in the next five years in Los Angeles and Oklahoma and New York City. We're a not-for-profit organization and we raise our entire budget annually. And if you came and met any of these young men, your heart would be absolutely broken. They didn't enter prison simply because they committed a single illegal act. Their stories are long, they're painful, and they're deeply troubling, and they involve almost all assets of our society. Multiple school problems, multiple school suspensions were the common story. Watching a father stab and bleed out on street corners Many in the foster care community, and I use the word care very cautiously, mothers who have drugged themselves to death, being the only sibling who's not currently in prison, coming with little belief in themselves and high suspect in others. And of course, all of them do not look like me. All are non-white. Many are dads who are really struggling with just seeing their child or children and just simply struggling about how to be a dad. And I don't even want to begin to talk about the issues for those who are currently not protected, who are not uh, currently legal residents of the United States. In short, they're really amazing human beings whose circumstances have broken them, and society and its structures and its current criminal justice system, I believe, has actually abandoned them. I'll give you this one vignette. We recently opened the house and we put new phones in. And the people came, you know, the normal phone company came and put phones in with cords we weren't specific about wireless. And the next morning, the most upset I had seen them over anything that had happened in the past year was that that phone looked like the ones in jail with a cord on them. And they definitely would refuse to, to use it. We're changing their lives daily, and it's amazing to see the process and the restoration and the atonement for wrongdoing, taking responsibility for their actions, being human, being a father, being a young man. But there are two key components that I want to close with, which I think are uh, what I want to engage our writ large community about that can change those data points to much more positive. One is our correctional theory in this country. 
We have a correctional theory about punishment and rehabilitation. It is completely absent redemptive theory. I don't believe it works without it. Of course, young men must atone for wrongdoing. And they must also give back and they must also be involved in restorative conversations to victims. But they also must be given the process to contribute, completely absent in the current correctional facilities we have. If you just think simply about going to college for the first time, when you leave high school, you put together your brag sheet, and your brag sheet has all these things you've done. You've worked at the dog pound, you've worked in a nursing home, you've done these extra courses. These are ways that you contributed. Anything like that is not available. And so therefore, the ability not to be able to contribute removes any thought of truly redemptive theory. We use a highly redemptive theory of corrections. And secondly, probably much more difficult and requires high risk is this notion of what's called deferred judgment. We're a very lucky organization that has secured an agreement, uh, only one that we're aware of, where if you are accused of a serious crime and you've gone through your trial and the judge is now waiting to give sentence uh, for what would be a felony, the judge agrees to defer judgment with the option of serving at our organization reset. Failure to work through our organization is an immediate return to a minimum of 17 to 15 years. Most cases, it's 25. If successful, however, no order is entered and therefore no felony. The true holy grail of corrections it's not a sealed record, it's not an expunged record. So every opportunity is possible to be a full father, to be a full significant other, to not be missing from society. Now it takes courage and it takes partners and it takes dedication and it takes rethinking. We need thoughts in so many ways in technology. How the individual attract, the typical, we call it ankle bracelet. There have to be better ways and appropriate ways medical records, educational opportunities, substance and trauma care, housing stability, food stability, employment, all are waiting opportunities for vastly better than we currently do. I would say that at the moment, for vastly less than nine and a half billion annual dollars, young men and children we can offer an ROI and an SROI that is at least a seven to one dollar for dollar return to the community. Currently our men who will be successful will have had 98 years of prison avoidance, an average of 14 years of prison avoidance per young man, no felony record. And I am encouraged beyond belief to think about what that would look like at scale against the numbers I opened with. I'm going to close with a quote that always moves me in this work, and it comes from Dr. King. And he was talking about modern psychology, and the word used more than any other word in modern psychology, maladjusted. And of course, we do not want young people to have a maladjusted life. He says, but I say to you, my friends, as I move to my conclusion, there are certain things in our nation, in this world, for which I am proud to be maladjusted and for which I hope good men will be maladjusted until good society is realized. I can honestly tell you, I do not intend to ever be adjusted to segregation and discrimination. I do not intend to ever be adjusted to religious bigotry or adjusting myself to economic conditions that take necessities from the many and give luxuries to the few. I urge others to join me in saying that we seek others who never intend to be adjusted to the current United States of Corrections in the US. Thank you so much.